Good evening, everyone, for those who can hear me, and welcome uh, to the third esophageal gastric webinar as part of the Orgis webinar series, and tonight, uh, especially so to the trainees, because this is a joint session uh, with the RU group, and we have the OG RU lead as part of uh, the chairs. So we've got myself, Sharj Wahed, I'm Dr. GI surgeon from Newcastle, the Northern Orgis representative, James Gossage, the OG Orgis lead, uh, from London, uh, Rich Evans, the OG trainee lead from the West Midlands, uh, and we've got a fantastic uh, panel uh, and presenters. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome from the Netherlands, uh, Arjun van der Veen, who's going to present the Logica trial, and also Jelle Roeder, uh, consultant surgeon from Utrecht. Uh, we also have uh, Alexander Phillips, consultant upper GI surgeon in Newcastle, Bruno Scrumro, consultant of vagina surgeon in Oxford, and two fabulous clinical oncologists, Dr. Lubna Bat from the Christie in Manchester, and Dr. Asad Qureshi uh, from Guy's and St. Thomas's in London. Um, in the first half of um, tonight's uh, webinar, we will have the presentation of the Logica trial and then discuss the findings of this. And in the second half, we are going to discuss and present a paper from the US about chemo radiotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting for gastric cancer. Um, I'm just going to give it another minute before we start, but um, what we might do is we've got four polls during the course of the evening, and if I can ask Nicola just to put the first poll up. Uh, whilst that is up, obviously this is meant to be relatively informal. There is a chat function, so please do ask uh, lots of questions. Uh, this is your opportunity to get up close and personal with some fantastic surgeons and fantastic oncologists and ask questions you maybe have been afraid to ask previously. So, uh, and especially so to the trainees. Um, so poll one is about default approaches for a subtotal gastrectomy or a total gastrectomy and whether either in your own practice for consultants uh, and senior trainees or as more junior trainees, uh, their exposure to or their experience of what the default approach would be. So I don't know if everyone can see the results of the poll. Perhaps it's only when I end the poll. But uh, for a subtotal gastrectomy, it's almost a 50-50 split uh, amongst people voting, uh, whether the default approach is open or laparoscopic. Uh, but for a total gastrectomy, very much in favour of an open approach. Uh, probably unsurprisingly, 80% suggesting an open approach and about 20% a laparoscopic approach. So if we end that poll, and I'm then going to hand over control. The poll results should be available, actually. Um, I'm going to hand over control to Arjun van der Veen, who's going to present the Logica trial. Thank you. Well, you should all be able to see my screen now. And if not, please give me a heads up. So I'm happy to present the Logica trial, and uh, I'm here together with Jelle Ruda, who was one of the PIs of this trial. Uh, so this was performed with a grant basically from the Dutch government, but we also had a small grant from Johnson & Johnson, which was only for proctoring prior to the trial. Uh, and when we look at advanced gastric cancer, we know that gastrectomy is the cornerstone of curative therapy. And in 2014, more than 90% of resections were performed open worldwide. However, in the Netherlands, as of late, we've seen a rapid adaption of laparoscopic gastrectomy. And our study group has done a poll, uh, a worldwide poll, to see um, what the basic, what the standard was in Europe, but also in Asia. And in 2014, we know that for advanced gastric cancer, we, we see these, these numbers minimally invasive really was not the standard. And this poll was repeated in 2020. And what we see is that there has been quite a shift worldwide. So advanced gastric cancer is more often operated on laparoscopically. And also in the Netherlands, we've seen a quick adaptation over the past, well, eight years. 
Uh, and we can say for the, in the Netherlands, for both total and distal gastrectomy, that the laparoscopic gastrectomy is now the standard with 80% being performed laparoscopically in 2019. Um, but when this trial was started, it was definitely not a standard yet. Uh, in the West, only non-randomized studies were available prior to uh, the Logica trial on distal and total gastrectomy. And from these trials or these non-randomized studies, we've seen that hospital stay could be reduced, complications were equal or also reduced, and lymph node yield was equal between open and laparoscopic surgery. And there were randomized studies available from the East, but only on distal gastrectomy. And these studies showed also basically the same, reduced hospital stay, reduced or equal complications, and the same lymph node yield. But it's important to note that the Eastern population is different than the Western population regarding gastric cancer. So the Western patients generally have a higher BMI, a higher age, more comorbidities, uh, more advanced tumor stages. Um, because the incidence is lower in the West, hospital volumes are lower. Uh, at the UMC Utrecht, we're quite a large hospital uh, gastric cancer wise in the Netherlands, but we do about 30, maybe 40 gastrectomies a year. And in uh, South Korea, for example, there are hospitals that do 600 gastrectomies a year. And they have screening programs in Asia, in, in Japan, in um, Korea, because it is so common. And we do not have screening programs in, in our countries. Um, in addition, we these trials from the East, they did not include total gastrectomies. They also did not include patients that received neoadjuvant therapy and they did not include quality of life data. So the, um, the guidelines from Eastern and also European uh, countries on laparoscopic total gastrectomy were that it should be considered an investigational treatment because there were concerns from complications and lymph node yield. So there was a need for Western multicenter randomized controlled trials to test whether it could be performed safely regarding complications and whether it could become uh, performed effectively regarding lymph node yield, regarding radicality, um, whether it would indeed lead to shorter hospital stay and whether it would result in better quality of life. That's why the Logica trial was started and these 10 centers in the Netherlands participated. The protocol was published in 2015 and we were very proud to present our results and publish them in the GACO earlier this year. So the aim was to compare laparoscopic and open gastrectomy and the hypothesis was that there would be no difference in oncological outcomes but that laparoscopic gastrectomy would lead to reduced hospital stay and reduced complications. The primary outcome was hospital stay and these were the secondary outcomes and I will address the first four this evening. The uh, design was a randomized trial prospectively the sample size was 210 patients and this was based upon a power calculation of a reduction in hospital stay from 18 days to 14 days. And remember, this was prior to the start of this trial. So this was based on a meta-analysis which showed this reduction in 2013. So that's what the power was based on back then. It was stratified, the inclusion between total and distal resection and it was stratified per center per hospital. Inclusion criteria were gastric uh, adenocarcinoma, which was surgically resectable. So CT stages 1 to 4A or all N stages could be included. Performance status had to be 0, 1 or 2. And exclusion was sewer type 1 cardiac carcinoma, non-elective surgery and history of gastric carcinoma or gastric surgery. Um, a distal or total gastrectomy could be performed and uh, lymphadenectomy had to be D2 and that included the stations that you see here. We had an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol in both study arms in place. And we had quite an elaborate quality control. So all surgeons were uh, GE certified and they were all able to perform laparoscopic and open surgery. Uh, so we had no surgeon bias in our study. And all surgeons participated this course prior to start of our trial, which was the one day introductory course and this was done to standardize the technique. And this course also included a cadaver session in the afternoon. All centers had to have a completed learning curve, which was defined as having performed at least 20 laparoscopic gastrectomies prior to the inclusion of the first patient in the Logica trial. 
and two laparoscopic cases per center were reviewed by OPIs. In addition, during the trial, the lymph node stations were marked and provided in separate containers by the surgeon to the pathologist. And after the lymph node dissection was complete, the surgeon had to make, take a picture. And here you see an example of an open surgery picture. You see the spleen, the liver and the esophagus. The stomach has already been removed. And what you can see is that the lymph adenectomy has been performed very well. You see a very clean common hepatic artery and splenic artery. And these pictures would be sent to us on a weekly basis and we would judge the pictures together with the PIs and then we would send feedback to the centers. So as far as the results go, 272 patients were randomized and uh, we lost a couple of patients in, in both study arms due to open close procedures. Uh, nevertheless, all patients were analyzed according to the intention to treat principle. Baseline characteristics were equal between both groups. Average age was about 86, 60% uh, was male. The BMI was about 25 in both groups on average. And also the ASA score didn't differ uh, apparently. The location of the tumor uh, was equal in both uh, groups. And also according to the CT stage, CN stage, and the neo event chemotherapy didn't show any surprises between the treatment arms. Um, 40% of patients received a total gastrectomy in both study arms and the remainder of patients had a distal gastrectomy or no resection. And there was one patient with a Seward 2 tumor who had a gastroesophageal resection without an anastomosis. Seven patients received a conversion in the laparoscopic arm and uh, about 6 and 7% in both study arms had an intraoperative complication. Operative time was significantly lower in the laparoscopic group, 30 minutes and blood loss was half in the laparoscopic group. Mean blood loss is this picture. So as for as the primary outcome, median hospital stay, this did not differ between treatment arms, unfortunately. Post-operative complications also did not significantly differ and was about 40% in each arm. And when we split this out, according to the clarin dinner grade, we also saw no differences. Anastomotic leakage also did not differ significantly, 10 and 11 cases. And also when we split this out according to the leakage grade by the uh, ECCV, we saw no differences. And in-hospital mortality also did not significantly differ. Lymph node yield median was equal, 29 nodes in both arms. And radicality of resection was 95% uh, in both arms. Overall survival up to one year uh, didn't significantly differ. And we also analyzed quality of life by the EORTC questionnaires. And these include skills ranging from one to 100. You have functioning skills, in that case a higher score is better. And you have symptom skills, and in that case a lower score is better. And generally, uh, a clinically relevant difference of medium size is regarded a difference of 10 points. If you look at one of these skills, the global health related quality of life, we see that at baseline, the laparoscopic group had an average of 70. And then we see the six weeks, three months, six months, nine months, and one year difference of the laparoscopic group compared to the open group. Or, well, basically there is no difference, as you can see. Not a clinically relevant and also not a statistically significant difference at all time points. This is a big slide, but it is only to show that we also looked at all other functioning skills and all other symptom skills. And the bold numbers are the statistically significant numbers. And what is striking is that there are so few significantly different numbers. We did this many tests and only these couple were significantly different, which just uh, goes to emphasize how little differences there were between the both arms regarding these endpoints. So in conclusion, we saw no difference in hospital stay, which was short in both arms. It was a median of seven days. We saw no difference in post-operative complications, radicality of resection, lymph node yield, one year survival, and one year quality of life. We did see less blood loss during laparoscopic surgery and a longer operation duration. Meanwhile, about the same time as our trial was finished, the stomach trial was also finished, which is a, a trial with a bit of a smaller sample size than the logical trial but it was nicely performed in Europe 
included total gastrectomy after new adjuvant chemotherapy patients, and it showed comparable results as the logic trial. So based on these two RCTs, these are the first RCTs showing safety of laparoscopic gastrectomy for Western patients with advanced gastric cancer after neoadjuvant chemotherapy in total and in distal gastrectomy in the logic trial. And we believe that laparoscopic gastrectomy in experienced hospitals is a safe and effective, yet not superior, alternative for open gastrectomy based on these results. So I would like to thank everyone who contributed to the study. And before we go to the discussion, I want to mention that we are currently doing an update on our esophageal uh, worldwide trend questionnaire. We did one in gastrectomy. I've shown you the, the data from that earlier. And we are also updating our esophageal um, questionnaire and we're hoping you can scan the QR code and also contribute to this. Thank you. Arjun, thank you very much for the fantastic presentation. Um, I'm going to go to our panel, first of all, uh, for some comments about this study. Um, I guess before that, Yella, is there anything else you want to add to Arjun's beautiful presentation? I think Arjun did a wonderful job. Um, and yeah, we can even go further on the on the differences that don't exist, um, because we also did our cost analysis now, which didn't show any difference. Um, uh, we looked at many other things and, and we really can't find a difference. So I think you can say that this is safe, it's feasible, it's, it's, it's oncologically safe. Um, and at the same time, we all feel, all the people that are involved, that this offers us a better way of doing this for our patients. Um, and also a more reproducible way. If we train our residents, if we train people, if we want to share images. Uh, so we think that we, we can't really lay our finger on, uh, on those benefits, uh, that we're sure that there are no disadvantages for the patients, uh, but we're still uh, finding the way to translate the, the, the experience benefits into patient outcomes. Yeah, I think that sums it up nicely, Helen. And if I can add one thing, we do have some very novel results in which we saw that according to the pain patients experience in basically the first week after surgery, that was equal between treatment arms, but we required less opioids to achieve that in the laparoscopic surgery. So that's one benefit we, we, we were able to find. Okay, I see Bruno has his hand up. He wants to, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think that James was raised his hand first, so I want to step in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, Bruno. Uh, but but I, think, I think in the UK, the, the data is that we're somewhere between 15 and 20% of gastrectomies have been performed laparoscopically. So we're, we're some way behind you guys at, at 80%. So. Congratulations on a, on a great study. Um, I did wonder whether you have got the opinion of the surgeons about what they prefer. I mean, the position you stand in doing a laparoscopic case between the legs, your your view, the way you're approaching vessels with that with the horizon and the angle of your instruments is very different from open surgery, where you're standing over the patient. Your posture is different. You have to bend your back um, and your neck, and certainly. Ergonomics are very important, especially for surgeons doing these procedures for, for 25 years or so. Um, so I'd be quite interested to know what the perception from the participants in the study felt about ease of surgery, access to clearing vessels, ease of lymphadenectomy, posture related ergonomics, tiredness, fatigue. Have you thought about that? I can maybe comment on this from a data perspective and perhaps Jelle can then add based on his experience. We did also look into this in the trial because surgeons had to complete this subjective mental effort questionnaire immediately after surgery, which meant as little as that they had to place one uh, cross on a scale from 0 to 150. And we did this in both study arms. And the result was uh, also basically no difference at all between uh, both arms. So. 
this is of course only one measurement uh, taken immediately after surgery, but surprisingly we, we saw no difference uh, based on this questionnaire. Um, and, and from a personal perspective, I think if you're experienced in laparoscopy, uh, you can do this. The, the, most of you do a laparoscopic mobilization or for gastric conduit, and a lot of you do bariatric surgery. So I think the, the dissection, if you compare it to, to an esophagectomy, the abdominal part is 90% the same. Uh, so only the basis of the gastroepiploic is maybe the, 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 the difficult part for, for most people that start doing gastrectomies. Um, so, so I think technically the dissection is, is more or less the same and people can do it. The hard part or the harder part is the anastomosis. And of course, for distal gastrectomy, it's simply the same thing as, post -bari as bariatric surgery. So an omega loop double, uh, double uh, bypass, I think that that's doable. We see, and, and we looked into this in the early learning curve of people in the Netherlands, we saw more uh, anastomotic leaks prior to Logica. Um, and I think the, the, the anastomosis is technically demanded. And we use an oral circular stapled. Uh, lots of my colleagues use linear stapled. And we recently are, uh, we not fully shifted, I can't say it in that way, but we had a couple of cases where we did a robotic manual zone anastomosis, also after total gastrectomy. Actually, I was most pleased with those last cases. So I think we will see some developments there. And there's one other thing I would like to, to comment on, and that's, I looked at all these images of, of surgeries, and those were surgeons that gave me their best image of their lymph node clearance. And I was pretty much able to judge it in a good way in the laparoscopic images, because those were really the same images that the surgeons saw at that time. But for open, it was sometimes very hard to get a good view and there were a lot of uh, things, a lot of uh, uh, the, the wound retractors, instruments, hands in the image. So I think if you look at reproducibility, teachability, I think lepar laparoscopy is really easier to share. Okay, Bruno, you want to step in? Thank you very much. Um, you started, if I'm correct, uh, um, with a, a length of stay post gastrectomy open of 14 days, and you ended up in a both group with a, a length of stay of seven, if I'm correct. It just uh, makes me think that uh, there is uh, another factor involved in the length of stay that is potentially even more important than the abdominal wall trauma. And um, I bet that is the enhanced recovery program, but I'd be really, really grateful if you could make a comment on that. Yeah, definitely. It's about the same time that we started this trial that I got to meet uh, a guy named Ed Chong, and Ed <laughs> really convinced me that this was the way to go. And I know he's he's in the audience, and I'm happy that he can't comment because he's muted. But, uh, but, but he really convinced us that you have to get these patients out of bed, you have to walk your patient, you have to motivate your team to get every single line out as soon as possible. And we pretty much introduced this during the trial. And many of the concepts were actually in the trial protocol that you can look up. And I think that that made, made a bigger change, obviously, than laparoscopy or open surgery. Thank you. Thanks, Ella. If I could just contribute. Have you also, oh, I'm sure you have, uh, look at the learning curve of the anastomotic technique of the various surgeons involved in the trial? Because uh, still a 8% lick rate is reasonably high. Thank you. I agree. And actually, we didn't look at it in the trial because, um, of course, you can define a learning curve in many, many ways. And I think you... Um, like some uh, other Dutch papers have done for esophagectomy, the learning curve for, for, for an intrathoracic anastomosis is estimated to be about 120 cases. So I think most of the Dutch centers didn't even reach that or by now have reached it, but not in the trial. Um, but we, we recently uh, looked at it together with the other Dutch group, uh, Camille Rosman and colleagues from Nijmegen, 
And we looked at the anisomonic leaks following gastrectomy and we couldn't find a trend. So I think, um, I, I think this is the, the, the most fragile part of this procedure. And I think we, we can still improve there. Uh, we should learn, I think, from our Asian colleagues, uh, although our cases are different. So I don't know what the ideal number of leaks would look like. Would it be 5%? Would it be 10%? I don't know. But I think we can still improve there. Yeah, if, if I may add to that, what we did look into in the Logica trial was a couple of centers that had only exactly 20 cases prior to uh, start and the centers that had more than 20 cases. And in both those subgroups, you saw no differences between laparoscopic and open gastrectomy. So the anastomotic leakage were, well, they were, they were present in both groups and present equally between open and uh, laparoscopic surgery. And indeed, it's, it's probably the weak point of the procedure both in open and laparoscopic surgery and more so in the total gastrectomy group than in the distal gastrectomy group. Um, and regarding ERAS, I think Jelle already commented beautifully on that. And one thing I might add is that some of the retrospective studies we saw before the logic at trial, they noticed the reduction in hospital stay. And I myself, I have no proof for this, but I think the early adapters of laparoscopic surgery were also the early adapters of ERAS programs. So that might be a bias by retrospective studies to a strongly reduced hospital stay with laparoscopic surgery. And the strength of this trial was that we had an ERAS program which was uh, decided upon with all 10 hospitals prior to start of the trial, which was equal in all 10 hospitals, equal between open and laparoscopic gastrectomy. And indeed, then you find a very short hospital stay and an equal hospital stay between uh, treatment rounds. Thank you. And Alex Phillips, you've got your hand up and then we're going to have one question that's been posted on the chat. Hey, thanks, George. So um, firstly, Arjun, I thought that was really beautifully presented. Thank you. Um, and it's a very nice study. Um, it's interesting when you hear the discussion because um, you have yellow and you have other evangelical saying, well, we've, we've shown that this can be done. We can get the same outcomes by doing this laparoscopically. And, and I think if you're a patient, the, there are two things you want to think about. There are, is the on oncological outcome. Is my cancer going to be cured equally well, irrespective of the procedure? And then there's the quality of life. Is my quality of life after this procedure going to be the same depending on how it's done and and it's interesting that effectively you, you're probably going to find that there's not really much difference in those two things so if we flip the whole thing on the the head is actually if you're doing an open gastrectomy which is probably what a lot of people have historically learned and taught why should you learn or go through a learning curve which will probably high, have higher levels of complications than sticking with something that has equally good outcomes so, so I don't think that there's anything there because if, if you're a, a kind of jobbing surgeon doing these gastrectomies and you do them open and I'm going to put my hand up and tell you I do both of these procedures open, you think to yourself, well, why am I going to try and learn to do it a different way when my outcomes are going to be comparable? And I suspect, I think that the real important thing here is that you look like a study, you look at a study like this and you see what the outcomes are where there is good quality control, which is really excellent. And you can use that to benchmark your outcomes. So if I'm doing it open and I'm finding my results not as good as the ones in this study, I maybe have to scratch my head and think, well, oh, maybe there's something I could be doing better. Maybe I should be thinking about laparoscopically. And equally, if you're doing them laparoscopically and your outcomes aren't quite as good as what, what people that have had quality control of their procedures are, are achieving, you need to think about what, what's different. Is it the patient cohort? Have they screened people out that's made it a bit better for them? Or is my cohort comparable to this cohort? And is there something else that's going on? But I think, you know, we touched about ERAS and I think that's probably the, the biggest thing that's changed outcomes in a lot of our patients in the last five years and has a really profound um, uh, impact. You, you want to say something about this, Aryan, or? Yeah, I, I can say a small thing about it. Um, yeah, I agree with your comment. I think if you do an, uh, a proper open gastrectomy, then it can be or is as good as a good laparoscopic uh, gastrectomy. And as a patient, I would be happy to be treated by a surgeon uh, that does an open gastrectomy well. But the thing is, I would like to be treated by 
the procedure that the surgeon prefers. And if he's skilled in laparoscopic surgery, then I would prefer that as a patient. And if he's skilled in open surgery, then that's also fine. That would be my comment on it. Um, Jelle, would you like to add anything? Uh, I, I fully agree uh, at this moment in time, but I think we're just at the beginning of digitalizing surgery. And I think laparoscopy, but more, more, even more so robotic surgery is the next step. And we're not gonna do unguided, unmapped uh, surgery without any digital tools in the in 10 years from now. I'm pretty sure that we'll have digital interfaces and apps that help us during surgery. And I think that laparoscopy, but even more so robotic surgery is needed for that. And of course you can do it wearing helmets and having digital, digital overlays in, in like, like Google glasses. But I think the way to facilitate this, this upcoming digitalization of surgery is through laparoscopy. And I think that that's why I'm happy that we didn't show uh, any benefits of open surgery. So we can still do both without harming our patients and, and, and still move forward. And I think that that's, that's why I prefer laparoscopic surgery over open surgery. But I fully agree that this trial supports open surgery as much as laparoscopic surgery. I'm going to... Actually, just leading on from that, Yellow, Nick Maynard put a question into the Q&A, just saying, what advice would you now give to senior trainees or young consultants who carry out open resections and are asking whether they should continue with open or learn minimally invasive? I, I would definitely jump on the robotic train and I would go to a center that is experienced with, um, with robotic surgery. A couple of centers now is now in the UK that, that really move forward and, and I would if I was a resident now I would do everything in my in my uh, possibilities to move to the center that, that does robotic surgery and then the final question for this uh, section just as if Iqbal has pointed out of the BMI around 25 I'm wondering that's amazing uh, I'm sure the panelist average BMI with gastric cancer is around 30 and would higher BMI be identified as a limiting factor while performing lap gastrectomy well, for us, not. I think it's it's uh, even. Um, I I like to do laparoscopic surgery over open surgery in fatter patients. Um, uh, I think it's easier. I think the fat is more of a of a problem in open surgery than in laparoscopic surgery. So that's my personal opinion. Um, we looked at our inclusion logs and the people that were excluded from this trial, but that was not because of BMIs. Um, it was because of comorbidities or refusal to be randomized or things like that, but, but not because of BMIs. So I think this re represents our day-to-day -day practice. And it might be that people in the Netherlands are, are a bit smaller than in, uh, in the UK. Could be. Yeah, we, well, we, looked probably. In, we looked into our inclusion logs and we also have the Dutch upper uh, GI audit. And what we noticed is that almost 50% of all eligible patients were included in our trial. So we have a very representable group, we believe, of, of general practice in, in the Netherlands. Okay, fantastic. Arjun, Jelle, thank you so much. Um, we are going to move on to the second presentation uh, from Rich Evans. But before that, I'm going to put up two polls. So uh, poll number two follows on from this discussion. Uh, Nicola, if we could have poll two up. So based on the study you've just heard, would you consider changing your default approach uh, for a gastrectomy? So interestingly, Arjun, oh, I'm going to just end that. I don't know if you can all see that, but you know, of the people responding, you know, forty-three percent of of people uh, have said they will, based on your study, Arjun and Yella, that they would consider changing not just your study, but I guess also on the discussions we've just had. Um, okay, and then if we can also have poll three. So this is in a lead up um, to 
uh, Rich Evans' presentation. Um, so I would like to know whether neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy for gastric cancer is ever considered uh, in the center that you currently work at. Just give it a few more seconds. Uh, of almost two thirds of you have voted. Um, so I'll end it there. Um, so interesting, a third of you say yes and two thirds no. I'll be honest, I'm surprised. I, I thought it'd be a lot lower in terms of the yeses, but um, uh, I think if we now move Rich, the floor is all yours. Thanks, George. Right, so I'm Rich Evans. I'm uh, the RU Group OG Cancer Lead. Uh, RU are the trainee arm of Orgis, and um, I'm very happy to say we've been growing from strength to strength over the past couple of years, and it's great to see so many trainees here this evening. So just a bit of background, really, to where we're, what we're talking about. Um, it, on the NOGCA database, the last report from 2020, last full report, we've not had 2021 yet. Certainly from 2016, 2019, three years, we're doing about 2,000 gastrectomies over that period of time um, with relatively low mortality rates but certainly highlighted um, when it came out perhaps our longitudinal margin rates are, are a bit high and I'm sure we're all looking into those but coming more importantly to the oncology and surgery um, I think we all like to think that uh, neoadjuvant treatment for our fit patients is the, the gold standard um, but still a lot of patients are still having surgery only. Of course, this doesn't tell you about their fitness, but something to consider as we move forward. So what are we talking about today? So I'm going to be talking about a paper from the States um, published in the annals this month, um, looking at chemotherapy versus chemo radiotherapy for receptable gastric cancer. So in America, certainly neagent chemotherapy for gastric cancer has been increasing increasing significantly since magic just for the trainees really um certainly magic showed that neagent chemo uh, chemotherapy improves survival for uh, curative gastric cancer but um certainly flot is changing the game certainly for esophageal and gastric cancer and certainly in the uk um probably is the mainstay of neagent treatment so just a bit of background to chemo radiotherapy really the gents and ladies of uh, MD Anderson who uh, form half of the paper we're going to discuss um, also put out their retrospective data um, in the Annals of Surgical and Oncology earlier in the year which showed that um, chemo radiotherapy had higher rates of complete pathological response um, and reduction in pathological TNM. Importantly however disease-free and overall survival didn't make a difference. So what did they do? They joined up with their colleagues or friends in Florida to look at um, a much larger cohort. Um, they both maintain a prospectively um, kept database looking at um, all, all the patients in the study um, underwent surgery. So they, um, they didn't look out at dropout rate, which is probably key, really. Looked at 17 years worth of data. Um, obviously, practice has changed significantly, particularly in um, neogen chemotherapy regimens. All patients underwent CTs, PETs, um, increasingly over the time period and also underwent laparoscopy and cytology. Um, just a bit of a plug for the trainees, really. Um, the plastic study that looked at the benefits of staging using PET and laparoscopy was published in JAMA Surgery um, in the last week and is definitely worth the read um, and that certainly will help guide practice moving forward in the future. So coming back to the study in question, um, the chemotherapy regimes inevitably change quite a lot over the 17 years and probably um, don't reflect current practice, as you would expect. No flot given in this study. Um, what was the chemo radiotherapy? Well, they were giving 45 grey, they were giving the induction chemo and they were also giving concurrent chemo. So they did two analyses, really. They did an analysis of the whole cohort the 405 patients that showed that certainly the um, chemotherapy arm looked slightly less fit with older patients, high rates of linitis, um, 
but the results importantly showed that chemoradiotherapy did improve disease-free and overall survival by quite a margin. Um, but so the so the uh, team then decided to look at propensity matched analysis, um, matching for age, sex, all the usual kind of things. They didn't match for performance status. Um, that wasn't recorded in their retrospective data. So let's get on to the important bits. Um, the matching, as you can see on the left of the screen, did appropriately match for things like age, sex, histology, um, procedures performed, and oncological uh, measures of surgery, such as lymphadenectomy, mean lymph nodes removed, um, and rates of uh, R0 resection. Um, length of stay was significantly longer in the chemoradiotherapy arm. Um, leak rates weren't significantly different, but the there was significant reduction um, with uh, chemoradiotherapy in the pathological TNM stage um, and also um, the rates of complete pathological response. So improvement um, of local treatment, as we perceive possibly with uh, chemoradiotherapy, improved pathological response. But did it improve survival? So there was marked survival improvement in the chemoradiotherapy arm. If we look down in the bottom left of your screen, certainly overall survival changed from 53 months in the chemo arm to 120 months in the chemoradiotherapy arm. So is this what we're all going to be doing in the UK in the coming years? As I highlighted earlier, really, there are as you can imagine, it's a retrospective study. There are certainly limitations. Um, they only included resected patients. So was, was there any dropout from um, the chemoradiotherapy outside the field? Um, we, they didn't include things like performance status and much like um, retrospective studies looking at comparing definitive chemo rad and um, neagent chemoradiotherapy and surgery for squamous cell cancer. We all know that um, surgeons like to pick a winner. Um, adjuvant treatment uh, wasn't added um, in, in the paper. So there are, there are a few gaps that probably leave us with a few questions. Just a few things to think about when we, when we come into our discussion. I'm sure um, our colleague from Holland will um, update us on, on the status of things like Critics 2. But um, Critics 1 didn't sh uh, show the, ad the addition of adjuvant radiotherapy didn't improve survival. So um, when we're starting to think about susceptibility of gastric adenocarcinoma to radiotherapy, certainly in that circumstances, which is obviously completely different to neoadjuvant, um, it didn't show much of a difference. What other trials are going on at the minute? Well, the Top Gear trial, um, certainly I know there's a lot of Australians involved, I think it's centered there, comparing um, chemotherapy and chemoradiotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting is underway. Um, but again, it's, it's incorporating ECF um, and an, as amazing as um, NeoHS is and were quite the achievement in completing it. I know um, there weren't too many flop patients in that and, as, um, and the relevance of it and how we use it and how we interpret it is, uh, is challenging, particularly in light of um, advancements in immunotherapy. Um, and certainly I know NICE in the UK are uh, approving nivolumab um, in the adjuvant setting after chemoradiotherapy for esophageal cancer. What is the role for things like nivolumab in um, PD-1 inhibitor in gastric cancer? Well, certainly in unresectable disease, metastatic disease, um, nivolumab did show some survival improvements. So what is the future of uh, the adjuvant treatment for Gastric cancer as a whole, um, is it chemoradiotherapy rather than uh, chemotherapy? And I suppose, how does that impact on things like the future of oncology, like uh, immunotherapy and nivolumab and advancements in that field? So that's it from me. Um, and let's go back to the panel. Thanks. Rich, fantastic presentation. Um, I'm going to go to our clinical oncologist, first of all, who You've patiently been waiting. Um, Lubna, do you have any comments about? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Asad and I are probably both in broad agreement that 
this isn't practice changing um, as a, a paper um, for the re many the reasons that um, Rich has just outlined really there's uh, missing information here and the big issue is that the chemotherapy used is no longer uh, standard practice and in fact, the pathological response rates seen in the study are in keeping with the regimes that were used, really. Uh, and you would expect them to be significantly better if you'd been looking at FLOT. Um, I think we commented earlier that what's interesting is, though, I, I guess what you'd be interested to know more about is what impact would be about the recurrences and whether those were local or distant recurrences uh, in terms of how the impact of radiotherapy and whether that could be improved further if you were integrating the chemo radiotherapy into a more standard chemotherapy regime as they will be I guess in, in studies like critics too. And Assad, what did you make of this study and, and just generally do you ever suggest offering new agent chemo radiotherapy in your practice? Um, so th thanks, Rich, for, for a very clear uh, and nice, uh, nice presentation. So, Sh Shad, we don't offer neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy for our gastric adenocarcinomas. I guess in the UK we have a very strong culture of perioperative chemotherapy on the back of the MRC MAGIC study, uh, and obviously now with the FLOP4 study. And so it's not something that is, is part of our you know, day to day practice. Um, if you know something like this does become established off the back of a, of a randomized control trial, it will probably require training amongst clinical oncologists across the country um, to, to, to look at how to uh, integrate this into our practice. Because I certainly, you know, from training and as a consultant, I wouldn't have had experience in offering neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy to the stomach. I think the, the interesting things from, from the back of this trial is, you know, what is it about chemo radiotherapy that could possibly have made a difference from a biological perspective? You know, we've seen that R0 resection rates were quite similar in, in both groups. Pathological complete response rates were 15%, which is similar to the FLOP4 study. But despite those similarities, the overall survival, median overall survival was far beyond what we've seen before in, in this group of patients. And so for me, what sort of reading between the lines, it, it looks like this study has probably sort of filtered out the good responders and is reporting, you know, the, the, the people that have responded well to upfront treatment um, and, and is reporting on, on those patients. Uh, that sort of, that's the, the impression that I get uh, from, from this paper, because there's, you know, unless we're, we're, we're thinking that, you know, chemo radiotherapy is, is, is having an abscopal effect on the immune system uh, and, and resulting in, you know, prolonging survival that way. I, I just can't, can't really see what else uh, we're, we're gaining from the, from the local treatment, in it, you know, if all else is equal. Okay, thank you, Assad. Uh, James, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Assad. Um, we certainly worry at uh, St. Thomas's about, um, well, two things. One is damaging to surrounding structures, depending on the location of the tumour. Uh, and the other thing is under treating disease that's outside the radiotherapy field. So just wanted to address those two points. I said, I guess we'll go to you first yeah. and then look at Yeah, I, I think in terms of under treatment, I think if you're going to take you know, a neoadjuvant radiation approach, you would you would probably use a total neoadjuvant approach with systemic therapy followed by uh, chemo radiation. So you probably wouldn't be under treating uh, outside of the radiation field. Uh, you're gonna have to remind me about your first question, James. What was the first? But it was just about uh, possible damage to surrounding structures. I know radiation is yeah. improving, but, but clearly- Yeah, so, I mean, I think it was uh, highlighted in the paper that actually, uh, during the the um, the analysis, you know, radiation uh, techniques were changing uh, from a from a, a three D conformal technique to to an IMRT technique, and so they did comment on that, but they didn't give any numbers. Um, and so, you know, there are definitely ways of 
being able to deliver treatment with um, better toxicity profiles for radiation. But as I said, you know, I, I would be surprised to, to know of many clinical oncologists in the UK who have that experience uh, to, to be able to, you know, say with confidence uh, uh, what the effects would be. And I think, you know, we'd need to, to learn from, from centres, you know, in, in Europe and North America uh, about how to, how to deliver radiation in a neoadjuvant setting safely. And Lubna, do you have anything else to add to that? No, James's think, questions. I, uh, yeah, no, I think I'd agree really um, in relation to the neighbouring organs. Um, it, radiotherapy has improved a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, but in that area, yeah, in the UK, we don't have an awful lot of experience, certainly in this sort of potentially curative setting. So people who are going to be hopefully long term survivors. Um, we give similar doses of radiotherapy in locally advanced pancreatic cancer, but unfortunately, those patients uh, don't usually see uh, many years of survival afterwards. Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, Yella's got anything to add to that because he presumably has more experience. Actually, not too much experience. We, of course, we participated in Critics One, but that was post-operative radiotherapy. And now we have Critics 2, and that's a three-arm study. Uh, and, um, and, and, and there we see pre-operative chemotherapy. We raised some concerns in that study about safety and toxicity uh, because we operated three patients in our center uh, with neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, and two out of three had an anastomotic leak. So, so we were not happy. Of course, that's the numbers don't really add up yet to, to, to draw conclusions for safety. But I think for me, the main reason is that I'm not that much of a fan of chemo radiotherapy is the natural behavior of gastric cancer. Gastric cancer patients die from peritoneal or distant metastasis. And I think chemo radiotherapy is not the way forward to offer them uh, survival benefits. I think we should really look at systemic or local regional peritoneal treatment, but then full peritoneal, and not just the huge area where the stomach is, but, but which has a lot of toxicity when you radiate it, but it still doesn't make a, a, an essential sense to me because you don't treat the full peritoneal. So that's, uh, in my perspective, um, why I don't really... Uh, think that chemo radiotherapy is the way forward. Maybe if there's a locally advanced tumor invading surrounding uh, structures, like in esophageal cancer, where you you have concerns about resection margins, uh, that that for me would be the place of chemo radiotherapy, also in gastric cancer. Thank you, Jelle. Bruno, you've been waiting patiently. Uh, no worries. Thank you. I think that the last two comments have. Uh, Kind of contributed to my the point I'd like to raise. Um, I wonder if this uh, study is uh, um, helping to defeat another surgical dogma that is uh, the increased uh, uh, complication related to radiotherapy in terms of uh, duodenal stump leak or anastomotic leaks in, in the case of a total gastrectomy because I am still quite terrified of putting an anastomosis in a part of an organ that has been irradiated. And in this uh, study, it doesn't appear that, you know, there is an increase in uh, the adenal stump leak or anastomotic leaks. So I, I wonder if either the details of the radiotherapy have, you know, have got more, more, more to be, um, to say, or maybe, yeah, we have to abandon this dogma. Yes, certainly, Bruno. I, I would share your concerns about sort of a, a, anastomosis, for instance, in a radiotherapy field in terms of a gastrectomy. But you know, I've got very limited experience of that. And again, Yella or if any of the uh, attendees have any comments on that? I can comment from my esophageal experience. Of course, we are under. Uh, you know, we, we, we treat all our, our also our adenocarcinomas with pros. Um, 
because I think that's in Holland uh, really the law of Van Lanschot. Uh, he really makes us all treat the, the pa all patients with cross, where, where I think we now have the evidence that chemotherapy would be as good for, for, for adenocarcinomas. But we looked in our own series, and there are some other papers that looked into it, that um, we saw more anosomotic leaks after uh, esophagectomy if the anosmosis was in the radiation field. And we could find a dose uh, outcome relationship there. So, so if there was more than 30 grays uh, at the site of the anastomosis, I think the chance increased by 22%. So, and we still use that, that, that we look at our radiation fields and if the radi radiation field goes high into the chest, we'll move and, 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 and do a neck anastomosis. Um, and, and, and also, if the tumor is a bit higher up, we try to avoid uh, the, the fundus uh, in our radiation field. And I think that the way forward there is to limit your radiation field as much as possible. And, that, and, and I can see that um, radiotherapy is, is advancing rapidly. And we now have MR Linux, we have proton therapies. So I think it will be much more accurate in the upcoming years. With, with less side effects. And so we can hopefully get rid of those. And maybe it's a dogma. I, I don't think the relationship is 100% is, is between radiation and complications, but we all uh, yeah, live by the dogma, I think. And, and we have some proof for it. Oh, Jen, I, I noticed you put a question on it and maybe Rich can answer this, just saying that you were surprised that in this study, uh, so many patients got neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy in, in what the standard practice was in these centres. They actually commented very little. Sorry, they actually commented very little on their uh, within the methodology about patient selection and and things like that. So um, I don't think I've got too much to add on that front. But certainly there is keen clinicians in that centre who have um, directed views on what they want, as we all do. And so a question back to Lubner and Assad. In this paper, they, they suggested that, you know, giving neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy uh, gave them more time for the unfitter patients to, you know, prehab them or physiologically get them improved in time for surgery. Uh, and similarly, because not all patients end up having the adjuvant part of their chemotherapy, you know, giving all their systemic treatment up front was a better way of giving that adjuvant therapy. Yeah, I'm not convinced by the prehab argument. If you're having daily radiotherapy for 25 days, I don't know how much successful prehab you're going to be having um, in that period of time. Um, but uh, I guess you, you do wonder whether some of the benefit was in the fact that they completely front loaded uh, the treatment, really, and gave uh, because we know from uh, you know, trials of, you know, one of the re one of the issues in my understanding in critics, one was that actually a huge percentage of patients never even get to adjuvant treatment. Final word from Assad. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with that sentiment that, you know, we know from our experience with rectal cancer that um, patients tend to complete more of their adjuvant treatment if it's all given up front um, you know so from our experience in, in the rectal cancer field there's now a trend for, for total neoadjuvant therapy uh, and I think that may be uh, one of the reasons why um, you know we, we see more complete more patients completing therapy if it's all given up front. I see it's now eight o'clock so I'm just going to finish with poll four if we can Nicola. Just to close this section. So based on this study, I know what my answer would be, would you consider or encourage use of neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy for gastric cancer? Okay, I'll give it five more seconds. Okay, so 80% of you have said no and 20% of you have, have said yes. Um, obviously, there is, I guess, some more research uh, or some results to be uh, 
shown to us hopefully in the next uh, year or two from Top Gear and from critics. Um, I want to say what a fantastic session we've had. Um, the next gorgeous uh, webinar is on um, the 17th of November, which is to do with the National IATL Registry and the BBUGS team. Um, but I want to say a massive thank you uh, to Nicola in the Orgis office for helping organise this evening, to Arjun and Yella uh, for presenting so well and a uh, fantastic study and uh, taking time out this evening. Uh, also to Drs. Lubna Bat and Asad Qureshi, um, Alex Phillips, Bruno Scrumro, uh, all the attendees, particularly the RU trainees uh, and everyone else, uh, and also the co-chairs, Rich, uh, great presentation, and also James Gossage. So hopefully we'll see plenty of you on the 17th.